Hey everybody, Evan Savage here. I'm the pastor of Grassroots Church. Thank you for joining us uh, by watching our messages from this past week or maybe weeks before. We are glad that you're taking time out of your week to learn, to engage with our church from an online point of view. We would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings for tangible community worship and of course some messages as well. Uh, and if that interests you, you, we would love for you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Thank you again, and I hope that this message is edifying to your spirit. Uh, we were thinking as a teaching team, uh, we need to go through a book. And at first thought, we were like, oh, we could just do it in the summer, like, eight or nine weeks in the book of First Corinthians, but then um, this past week, uh, through uh, our emailing back and forth, I've, I, I just said, you know what, there's too much in, in this book that there's nothing really we could like, gl like glance over. Like there's nothing really we could pass over. A lot of books of the Bible, some books are, they're like stories where you're like, okay, here's a lineage, we can skip that part. That's not necessarily true uh, for the First Corinthians. And so, Truth of the matter is, is we do not know how long this series is, is going to go. Um, I think we are actually preparing, in all reality, uh, we're preparing for this series to go at least up till Christmas. So uh, we're gonna, probably going to take a break in there uh, around September or October and do something for a couple of weeks different, but this series is going to take a fair uh, bit of time. Uh, one of the things uh, that I think that as we uh, discover in this text is that 1 Corinthians is extremely, extremely relevant for us today. Um, this is not one of those books that it does not take a lot of exegesis or hermeneutical deep dives to try and understand what it's saying. This book is almost like it could be written to us today. But I do love uh, 1 Corinthians. I've been reading it uh, through for the past few weeks, and uh, truth, uh, you know, a little bit uh, behind the curtain a little bit. Uh, in 2011, I was going to a church in Columbus, Georgia, and we, we love that church, and uh, the pastor, Dr. Keith Cowart, was awesome, but he did the whole year in the book of 1 Corinthians, and every he preached almost every Sunday for about an hour and a half on, the, on a se section of the book of 1 Corinthians, and quite frankly, it was the most probably uh, transformative or formative preaching I've ever sat and listened to. Uh, there was just so much detail, there was so much nuance, there was so much uh, a relevancy to uh, my daily life and the communal life of the church. And so I am actually really excited to, to journey with you guys in this book as we go. Uh, one of the things, really quickly, uh, housekeeping-ish type things, when you walked in, there was a table that says, take one. How many people took one? A few. Uh, there are two. There's a bigger sheet, and then there's a small sheet. Uh, the bigger sheet are for people who need bigger words. So if you're, like, younger, uh, take the smaller sheet. We only have ten of the bigger ones. We're trying to preserve paper. We're trying not to waste a, a, a lot of paper. So we want to preserve as much paper as possible. So take one of the smaller ones. If you need a magnifying glass or something, they probably sell them at the dollar store or something. I, I don't know. But So f take those. What those are going to do, those are guides for us during the week to read 1 Corinthians together. They're not sermon note things. It's not like fill in the blank, point one. They are for us for on Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday to answer questions, to read, to engage, and to uh, really dig deeper into the scriptures as a congregation on our own time. I was talking to somebody this week at Prairie Street, and uh, I, I he was asking what I was doing. I was like, well, I'm preparing for this series that's coming up called 1 Corinthians. And uh, he knows a, a little bit about the Bible, but not uh, a ton. He was like, oh, yeah, how long is that going to go? And I was like... I have no idea. I was like, to be honest with you, uh, I'm struggling. Like today, we're only covering three verses. So I, I'm struggling to uh, uh, figure that out. So this is going to be a journey, and this is going to be a marathon, and this is hopefully going to speak into us a spirit of what it means to be a church in this city. 
The church in Corinth was a church that existed in a city, in a place, in a time. And how can we uh, take from the scriptures and apply it to us today? But before we get into this, let's pray together. Pray with me. Father, I pray this morning, uh, first off, thank you, thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to gather uh, and to worship and to engage with one another. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, 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 do this with the full freedom and the full expectation of your movement in our lives. Lord, I pray that as we begin this series uh, in 1 Corinthians, that, that you will begin to stir in our hearts and our minds what it truly means to be disciples, radical followers of Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, thank you for today. Thank you for our time. In your name I pray, amen. So this morning's going to be like we do when we ever do the books. It's going to be a little bit of background information. Uh, it's going to be probably more background information than you want. But the background information, in order for us, in order for us to understand what Paul is trying to get across in the book of 1 Corinthians, it's best for us to contextualize this as much as possible so we can actually understand why Paul is saying the things that he's saying to this church. So a little bit of background. 1 Corinthians is one of the oldest texts we have in the New Testament. Uh, the only, there are only three books that are older than 1 Corinthians. There is uh, Galatians, which was written in the mid-40s AD. You have, and then 1 and 2 Thessalonians, which were written about a year or two before uh, his letter to the, to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was written anywhere between 51 A.D. and 57 A.D. And Paul, oh, I can't remember where he wrote this from. I think it might have been... Jeff, do you know where he wrote this? I, I read it the other day, anyhow. Uh, but, he, but he wrote this letter as, as a, response to, a response to a different letter he wrote. Does that make sense? So he wrote this letter as a response to a response to a different letter. We know that Paul spent about 18 months, if you read Acts chapter 5, or Acts chapter 18 rather, we know that Paul spent about 18 months in the city of Corinth. And he followed, uh, he was in Corinth directly after his time in Athens. If you look at a map of Greece, you see Athens is here and Corinth is probably like an hour's drive, if he had a car, an hour's drive uh, to the city of Corinth. And just like Athens, remember when we went through uh, we talk, what did we talk about, Paul? Oh, the, the first series this year, we talked a lot about how Paul's rhythm, specifically in Athens, how he, how he observes and he dialogues and he offers the gospel. Paul does the very same thing here in the city of Corinth. Now, Paul left Corinth because the synagogue people wanted to kill him. And they brought him to the governor's palace, and the governor said, I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, I, you guys aren't allowed to kill him. Uh, one, he's a Roman citizen, and uh, he has full protection. You're not allowed to do this. Uh, and so instead, what happens is Paul leaves, and then the synagogue people kill, the, or not kill, they beat up uh, the leader of the synagogue named uh, something Ease. Uh, it's at the beginning. We'll see it here in a minute. A little bit about Paul. We need to know a little bit about Paul. Paul was born in the city of Tarsus, which is modern-day Turkey. It's north of Judea and Galilee. And uh, he was, Tarsus was a very uh, Greek or Hellenistic culture. What Hellenism is, is basically when Alexander the Great took over basically the whole Middle East as well as the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, he influenced or he mandated Greek culture, Greek thought, Greek uh, philosophy and mythology. And Tarsus Tarsus was one of the epicenters of this Hellenistic culture. So they were steeped, even though they were primarily Jewish people, they were steeped in Greek uh, ideas and philosophies, cultural norms, things like this. And Paul grew up with this. Paul knew philosophy. His earliest education would have been primarily a Greek education. But at the age of about 14, Paul, his parents sent Paul, who was a very, very smart, very, very bright, sent Paul, who was named, known as Saul at that point, to Jerusalem to study under probably the greatest teacher of the time in, first, in the first century, in first century Jerusalem. By man, his name is Gamaliel. The man's name was Gamaliel, which we know from Acts chapter 5. But Gamaliel was known as the teacher of teachers. Um, he took this title away from Nicodemus. When Nicodemus died, Nicodemus was the teacher of teachers. When he died, Gamaliel took that uh, title from him. In other words, he was like the primary theologian for all of the Jewish people of the day. 
And so we know a few things about Paul, that he was highly educated. He was a Roman citizen because he was born in Tarsus. And he uh, had this, this zeal, this, this real pharisaical zeal for the Jewish faith. And so we know this about Paul. And so when Paul writes a lot of stuff, and we're, we're, what we're going to find out in 1 Corinthians, you can almost feel the zeal coming through in his words. Because, uh, spoiler alert, this is not a happy letter. Paul is not happy with the church in Corinth, but we'll get to there in a minute. A little bit about the city of Corinth. Corinth was uh, 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 a trading city back in the in before uh, the first century, but it was destroyed in the second century BC uh, because Romans do what Romans do, and they like to destroy things that aren't theirs. But in 44, uh, 44 BC, about two months before he was assassinated, Julius Caesar actually mandated that the city of Corinth be rebuilt and rebuilt for a purpose, and that he was going to rebuild the city to be a city that was populated by freed peoples. So freed men is what they were known as. So people who used to be slaves who were freed, they were going to be sent to Corinth to live a life and to be happy and prosperous and all of those things. Corinth was a very wealthy city. It sits on this uh, isthmus um, that connects the two peninsulas of Greek, uh, connects the Peloponnesian Peninsula with the mainland of Greece. And uh, it, in order for you to get from Rome to Athens, kind of the two big cities at the time, Rome and Athens, you had to go right through Corinth. And what would happen is these ships would come into the Bay of Corinth, and the people would, they would get out, and then they would drag their ships across the isthmus to the other port, and then sail on to Athens. So high, a lot of wealth, a lot of trade, a lot of money. You couldn't go through the empire by ship unless you went through Corinth. But Corinth, because it was wealthy, because it was prosperous, because it was, it was really a new culture, they had a really different way of life and they valued a lot of things differently from the rest of the Greek and Roman world. They valued freedom, obviously. They valued the freedom to live how they want to live. They were once slaves and now they are free. So they valued freedom more so than any of the other cultures. The second thing is they valued sex. Uh, the, the, the primary temple was the temple to Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and sex. And so they valued sex. They also valued pluralism. There were these people known as sophists, which means wide men, wise men. It's where we get the word sophisticated from. And the sophists, what would happen is these sophists would come into town, set up shop, and people would gravitate towards them, and they would choose a sophist to learn under and to study with in that. Other things that mattered, or, or another thing that mattered was that status. Status was key to Corinthian culture. How you lived your life was key, and how you presented yourself to others was key to Corinthian cultures. It mattered a lot. The clothes that you, the clothes that you had, how, how did you look? How did you dress? How did you speak? Which sophists did you follow? And then the other thing is that sophists, when they came into town and set up shop, these people would pay like a small fortune to become their followers. So you couldn't follow a sophist unless you paid like a ton of money to follow them. And this gives us a little bit of context for Paul. When Paul enters the city of Corinth, he's immediately seen as one of these sophist people or sophi, I don't know, right, sophists. People. And he was intellectual just like them, and he spoke eloquently just like them, but he differentiated himself for two reasons. The first reason is anybody can come and listen to Paul. You don't have to pay a dime. So that's the first thing. His teaching was free for all. The second thing, unlike all the other sophists, is Paul worked with his hands. He was a tent maker. We also know that when he entered Corinth, he made tents to make himself survive. And so he was a tent maker. Other sophists, uh, hard work, manual labor was below them, but not for Paul. Paul still made tents. Paul still worked with his hands. So he differenti differentiated himself in those two ways. Now let's, we know a little bit about Corinth. We know a little bit about Paul. Now let's look at the Corinthian church. And we're looking at this church, and we're calling this a church in crisis, because in reality, this church, if you read 1 Corinthians, is on, it's on the brink of crumbling. It's on the brink of breaking apart. It's on the brink of, of just dissolving into the Corinthian Bay, if you will. 
It's a church that has allowed the outside social and cultural pressures to creep into how they practice their faith, how they lived out their faith, and how they worshiped with one another. You see, it's, it's one of these things that, that, that this church, I mean, we'll see this at five and seven, a lot like Athens, the church in Athens. In chapters five and seven, this church was dealing with that Epicurean type philosophy, that hedonistic type philosophy in a way, but it's not necessarily as big of a, of a problem as we might lend itself to believe. There was probably one or two bad apples that was kind of ruining the whole thing for them. But obviously a big, huge problem in the church was division and rivalry. That sophist culture was creeping into the life of a church. When Paul says, some follow Paul, some follow Apollos, that is a cultural norm that has crept, crept its way into the life and the worship of the church. But 1 Corinthians is gonna, it's going to address really four kind of major themes in this. The first one is that the Corinthian church, the Corinthian Christians had strong spiritual zeal. They wanted the spiritual gifts. They wanted to speak in tongues. They wanted those spiritual gifts. But as Paul says, they lacked maturity in Christ. So they had this desire to be filled with the spirit, but they lacked maturity in Christ and didn't know how to use those gifts for the betterment of the people. And what that, what that means is that when you lack maturity in Christ is that you become unteachable. And for, for all these, for Paul and even Apollos, that the, that the Corinthian people were unteachable. They were twisting Paul's words and probably Apollos' words to find loopholes to justify their actions, justify their way of life outside of the church. So the first thing is they had a strong zeal, but they lacked spiritual or they lacked maturity in Christ. The second thing again, is that they were allowing all of these cultural norms, these things like choosing a teacher, division, rivalry, sexual immorality, uh, status symbols. If you speak in tongues, they saw that as a status symbol. So you see these cultural norms creeping in to the church. The third thing was their gatherings lacked order. We will see this when we get from chapters 11 through 14. Their gatherings lacked order. They were chaotic. They were, people weren't really listening. The, the word wasn't being teached well, or the word wasn't being listened to, at least. Then the fourth thing is that there was probably, most likely, a, uh, uh, a doubt in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That this church wasn't really on board fully with the resurrection of Jesus. And the more and more I've read through this book over the past few weeks, the more and more a quote kept coming into my mind from Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson once wrote this. He said, Christian churches are not as a rule model communities of good and moral behavior. They are rather to be places where human misbehavior, misbehavior is brought out in the open, dealt with, and faced. Does that make sense? So churches, as a rule, are not to be models, model communities of good behavior, but rather a church is to be a place where we could come together and bring our baggage, bring our sin, bring our hurt, bring our issues, and collectively lay them out onto the table and at the feet of Jesus. That's what the church is to be. And when you read 1 Corinthians, you can see that Paul is calling them to own up to their own stuff. Like I said, the first Corinthians is actually the second letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. The first letter is lost to history, and the third letter is also lost to history. Uh, so the first letter was lost. We know this from uh, chapter 1, verses 11, uh, or actually we know this from chapter 5, but we know that Paul got a letter from Chloe's people detailing what is going on in the church. It's chapter 1, verse 11. We know that he got this letter, and this is Paul's response to that letter. Like Paul probably got this letter from Chloe and then was like, hold on a second. These people need another addressing. These people another smackdown. So as, uh, as we go through this, as we go through this letter, I want us to do a couple of things. The first thing I want us to try really hard to do, and that's why part of the reading, the little paper things are for us during the week. The first thing I want us to try to do, I want us to try and read this letter as if it were written to us. Not as some distant 2,000-year-old church that seems so, oh, yeah, they dealt with that. We don't really deal with that. Like we tend, That's how we tend to read Scripture a lot is we put ourselves above as if we're looking in. I want us to place ourselves as the recipients of this letter. 
What would it be like to receive something like this? What if it's, what if, what would it be like to be reading these words as we read it? Because like I said, Paul is not necessarily happy with the Corinthian people in this letter. So that's the first thing. I want us to figure out how to read that. And the second thing is, is I want us to spend time that again with those with those papers each day each and every day I want us to spend time reading what's prompted on those papers for instance this week is verses 1 through 17 and do it every day and answer the questions that are on there every day and really dive down dig deep and dive down into this together so that we can really truly become a better community of believers and then the other thing is I want us to think about specifically in our city what does it look like to be a church? So if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sosthenes, that's the guy's name, Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though this is a very short little three three verse introduction to this book, I think we tend to look past the like let's get to the meat. There is some meat in these three verses that Paul is giving off here. There are really four things that Paul immediately is addressing to the church in Corinth that is different from how he addressed his churches in previous letters. If you read the Thessalonian letters and if you read Galatians, that that introduction looks vastly, vastly different. The first thing that Paul's addressing here is his apostleship. Not, you know, there was this belief in, in, in the Corinthian church that Paul was just kind of using that term as, a, as an authoritative term. I'm an apostle, you better listen to me kind of a thing. But Paul addresses this not as, hey, this, I'm not the one who's giving myself authority here. I, I never wanted to be apostle. That word called means to be summoned into. I was summoned into apostleship by God's will. So the first thing immediately, he's like, I'm not an apostle because I think I am. I'm an apostle, I'm a, I'm an apostle for, uh, because of the will of God. See, the first century didn't really have, first century church didn't really have a lot of organization to it. It was becoming more and more organized as the century went on. But Paul's, uh, but, so what would happen is that there would be like these leaders, primarily James in the city of Jerusalem, and out of Jerusalem went all of the, all of the apostles who were sent to preach and plant churches. And their primary duty was to plant, ch- preach the gospel, plant churches, and then hold those churches to account, to be overseers of those churches. Now, by the end of the first century, the, the titles of bishops became a thing and all of that by the end of the first century. But right now, all there is is really the apostles, the apostles and then the local elders of the church. And so Paul is addressing, hey, I'm not an apostle because I think I am. I'm an apostle because God summoned me into this role. And I think one of the things, the second thing that I think we have is, is, is that Paul makes it clear right off the bat that the church is not their church, the church is God's church. Look at what Paul says here. And this is different from Thessalonians and Galatia. Look at Paul, to the church of God at Corinth. I think there's a proclivity a lot of times, especially in our culture, to see, to, to see churches as ours. This is my church. This is where I go. I have ownership of this church. Like we have this idea. And what that, what that causes is it causes us to, to have an unhealthy view of the community of God. An unhealthy view of how we worship, an unhealthy view of the theology that is teached or the Bible verses that are preached. And if we see the church as ours, we don't recognize that this church doesn't belong to us, but this church is God. A few things, if we take too much ownership over it, a few things happen. One, we will be likely to get rid of uncomfortable theologies and teachings. We see this happen all the time, whether conservative, whether liberal, whether Pentecostal, whether Methodist, doesn't matter. We see this happen over and over and over again, that we will or have a proclivity to get rid of the things that make us uncomfortable. 
Another thing is that we will have a proclivity to divide ourselves from other church communities. I like this pastor, he preaches like this. I like this pastor, they preach like this. And it's a division and almost like a, like a, like a strange little rivalry that tends to happen often. Another thing, if we have too much ownership, uh, you're more likely not to see yourself being led by the Spirit of God, but you see yourself being led by people, and we allow cultural norms to creep in into how we practice our faith and how we worship together. When we see church as our possession, we are far more likely to change stuff without any sort of spiritual accountability. I've, I've been a part of churches that will like change the bylaws because they're too restrictive or whatever. Like we'll change stuff without any spiritual accountability at all. So the first thing that Paul does is he makes clear right off the bat that the church is his. The second thing Paul does is he tells us something about Christians. He tells us something about Christians in these first three verses. He says that, he says, to the church in court, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says something about Christians. The first thing is he says Christians are sanctified. That word sanctified is uh, hagiazo in Greek. And what hagiazo means is it means to be set apart for God. To be made holy by the offering of a sacrifice. In other words, what it's saying is to be a Christian is to be one for whom Christ died and we know it. And because of Christ died, we are now set apart for God. It's a belonging statement. So the first thing is the church about Christians is we are sanctified. We are made holy, not by our actions, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is why we are made holy. The second thing that he says is that they call, they're called to live holy lives. That word in English is saints, called to be saints. What that word actually is, is hagios, so it's a play on the first one. Paul is using a little word play. Hagios, what that word means is it describes a person that has been, de that has been devoted to the possession and the service of God. So a saint is somebody who is devoted to the possession and to the service of God. Before the Christianity, it was a word that was used to describe a temple or a sacrifice. But now it is reserved for the people, that we are dedicated to the service and the possession of God. It is, quite frankly, a call to live what Christ claims that we are, to live holy because Christ calls us holy. So first, God makes us holy. The second thing, we are called to live holy lives, and we'll talk a little bit more of that as the series goes on. And then the third thing Paul says is that he calls us to embrace the universality of the church, or in Latin that is Catholic, not as in like Roman Catholic, but to embrace the universality of the church. Paul says, in the company of those who call, who in every place call upon the name of the Lord. Christians are called into a community whose boundaries include all of earth and all of heaven. I love what uh, William Barclay says about this. He says this, he says, it would be greatly to our good if sometimes we lifted our eyes beyond our own little circle and thought of ourselves as part of, a, of the church of God, which is as wide as the world. Should I say that again? It would be greatly good, it, it would be greatly to our good if we sometimes lifted our eyes beyond our little circle and thought of ourselves as part of the church of God, which is as wide as as the world. So Christ, or, uh, Paul says something about Christians, that we are made holy through Christ's sacrifice. We are called to live holy lives, and we must recognize that we belong to a much, much larger community than this. And the third thing that Paul's, or the fourth thing, rather, that Paul says here in the first three verses is that Paul says something about Christ. It's funny. In the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions Jesus 10 times. 
Paul knows that this letter is going to be a difficult read, that this letter is not going to be received very well. And instead of going to his people with laws and rules and books of discipline or strategies or systems to get better, Paul is coming to the people fully in and with the power of Jesus. He's not looking to set out a bunch of like disciplinary rules and you must do this. He is coming fully in and with the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we find here the first declaration, the true declaration of who Jesus is. Believe it or not, in most English Bibles, they denote it, but Paul corrects himself here in verse 3. Or ver- yeah, verse 3. Paul corrects himself. Uh, what, what, what Paul says... Look at what he says. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified who all in every place, both theirs, uh, who call in the name of the Lord Christ our Lord, both their, both their, oh wait, where is it? Both their Lord and ours. It's on the back of the one I was holding. Both their Lord and ours. In, in most, there's what is known as an M dash, which is like the lo- elongated dash that you see a lot. In an M dash, what they do when they're translating scriptures is they denote that when a writer makes a correction. So in the original letter, you could almost see that Paul made a, corrected himself in what he was saying. And we see that when Paul says, uh, comes to Jesus Christ, our Lord, he's almost saying, actually, no, not just our Lord, their Lord as well. It's a qualifying mark. Paul is saying that Christ is not just Lord of those who have faith in him. Christ is Lord of all creation, regardless of whether you believe it or not. That Christ is Lord over all. It's the same thing if you go back to the book of Jonah. When Jonah is sitting and sulking and being a little baby underneath the tree. And God says, why are you sad and upset? He's like, because you saved Nineveh. And what does God say? Who cares what they believe? They are still my people. I still created them. So what Paul is saying is like, you are looking at outsiders as out. That Christ isn't their Lord. No, no. Christ is both our Lord and theirs also. And when we start to see people being under the headship of Christ, whether they believe it or not, it changes how we treat others. So to begin our journey, I know there's a lot of like weird information here. The next series, the next sermons, I promise is going to be a little bit more. Well, it's first Corinthians, so it's not going to like feel good, but it'll be a little bit more sermony. But I really want us to reflect on or place ourselves as we read this again, this week's assignment, because it kind of is an assignment. This week's assignment is to read first Corinthians chapters one, first uh, Corinthians chapter one, verse one through 17. I want you to begin to place yourself as the recipient of this letter. I want us to allow this letter not to be something necessary that we need to learn, even though we're going to learn about it and we're going to learn what's in it. But I want us to see this letter as something that can challenge us, that can stretch us, and that can grow us. That could cause us to really be like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Paul is writing this, but I am uncomfortable with what Paul is writing here. Because there's going to be a lot of discomfort in what Paul is writing. I'm uncomfortable with what Paul is writing here. How can this challenge me and cause me to sit and wrestle? And hopefully, God willing, call you to fall on your knees in repentance of whatever sin or baggage you might be carrying around. So I want us to get into the challenge. Why did Paul write this? What, this is really, really, really hard for me to take in. So allow the letter. So really see yourselves as a recipient of this document. And this week, as we go along and as we continue this series, just remember these things. That the church, Grassroots Church, Court Street United Methodist Church, Second, uh, Second First Church, the Episcopal Church, Every other church in town, it is not ours. Christ makes, or Paul makes a point in saying, the headship of the church is Christ, not me or Apollos. So it's not ours. We don't have ownership over this. This is not, we are called to live in this and participate in it and to take care of it, but we are not the owners of this thing. We are called simply to participate in church, in the church, to invest in the church, and to grow with the church.
It's not ours, it is Christ. So in the second thing, we must remember that we are made whole. How many times do we ever think throughout the week when we go through issues, ah, but Christ has made me holy. You ever think about that? Uh, Christ has called me righteous. So remember that we are made holy and allow that holiness to bleed into our actions and our words. To see our church, and, the, and then the, finally, to see our church belonging to the whole body, that the whole body of Christians, that we are all made holy and called holy and called to live holy lives. And then the final thing is that we must see regardless, start seeing people under the lordship of Jesus, whether they believe it or whether they don't. When you're on Facebook, because somebody's driving you nuts because of some sort of political thing, they are under the lordship of Jesus. When you are down at the street and you see somebody who's driving you crazy, they are under the lordship of Jesus. And I want us to reflect on those realities as, as we go through this text together. So this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And then there's questions that they answer as well. But let's pray together.